happy Sunday. We're going to worship together. Come on, can we put our hands up like this? God, we thank you for your presence, God.
Would you just come and rest upon this building right now, God? Yeah. Father God, we fix our eyes on you. God, you're our only focus here this morning. God, would you get all of the glory, all of the praise. God, there's nobody like you. God, we just thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for the joy and the peace that you bring, God. God, even in the middle of chaos, God, you are peace. And so God, we thank you for your presence that's here right now. God, we run to you this morning. We just want you. God, we worship you. We worship you for who you are. And God, we love you. Let's go. 
I've done it all If the best thing that I've seen is your glory Then I've seen your love that's changed my life Forever satisfied One word, one word is the only thing Then I've heard it all If I feel your heart but it never see I still have it all, no treasure of this life, but you are my everything, oh God, you are my
met with a gentleman this week who um, had, had just had a bunch of questions about Jesus. And he came and met me here at the church and uh, we went literally one by one through all of his questions. And there was a theme. And the theme was not explicitly said in the questions, but it was clear. And the theme was that there was almost a lack of trust, a lack of faith in who God is and what he's accomplished and what that meant for him. And there was a theme of shame and guilt and condemnation that he's carrying. He's a, he's a believer, he comes every week, he reads his Bible, he, he, he checks all the boxes, but he cannot unload this shame, unload this guilt and actually fully step into the, the promises that are in God's word. And we're, we're singing this song, Great is Your Faithfulness, and I, I just wonder how many of us here actually maybe have trouble singing the words. We have trouble declaring the words. Maybe we sing them just because they're on the, on the screen, but do we actually believe that he's faithful? And do we actually know what that means, that he's faithful? Because faithfulness doesn't mean that he's just gonna give you whatever you want. Faithfulness doesn't mean that you can make a desire and he will just, answer, give you that exact thing. He, he will be faithful to himself. He will be faithful to what his word says. He will be faithful to the promises that he's spoken over us. In Hebrews 10, verse 19, it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, everyone say confidence, confidence to enter the most holy place. This is talking about the temple where God dwelled. We believe God now dwells in us. He doesn't just dwell in this building, but certainly I believe when we gather, God's presence is here with us. When we enter into his most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. This is the word of God over your life this morning, church. There's a lot of theology in this. What's this mean? It means his body is, is the curtain. He, in, by the blood of Jesus, he makes a way for you to enter into the holy place. No longer do you need someone to go on behalf of you into the presence of God. In the, in the Old Testament, they needed a priest, the high priest, to go in on behalf of me into the presence of God once a year so he can make a sacrifice on behalf of me so I can be in right standing with God. That's how it worked. And when Jesus came, he was a perfect sacrifice, a once and for all sacrifice, and said he is now the high priest who actually has walked in our shoes, been tempted the same ways we were tempted. And Jesus, by his death and resurrection, makes a way for you to enter into his presence. You don't need me to go in before you. You don't need a pastor to go in before you. You get access. You get Jesus. You get him for yourself, for you. And because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, because he is the high priest, you got a perfect mediator and a perfect sacrifice in heaven, standing for you, defending you. And so God doesn't look at you and see your mistakes or see your guilt or see your shame. It says it's been washed away in the blood. Hit Jesus' righteousness on you, and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Say, you see that person? That's my son. You see her? That's her, I died for him. You see her, I died for her. And so we got full assurance in the faith that we have. So come on, we're gonna declare this. If you don't believe it, speak it over your own soul. Because when we leave here, we gotta know the truth that we stand on. Great is his faithfulness. Faith. church.
come on, can we celebrate a God who's faithful to his word, who made a way for me, who made a way for you. The confidence, the assurance. If there is one thing I want to pray over us, one thing I hope you leave today is that you are assured in the goodness of God, in the faithfulness of God, and how much he loves you. And you got a perfect king, a perfect sacrifice in Jesus, a perfect mediator on your behalf saying, yeah, yeah, you see that one? I, I separated their sin as far as the east and from the west. You see him, I don't, I don't even count his sins. It keeps, our love keeps no record of wrongs. I see Jesus when I see that. You got a God who loves you today. Amen, church. Amen. Come on. We believe it. We're not celebrating ourselves. We're celebrating a God who loves us. Amen. 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 Hey, hey, why don't you turn to someone next to you, tell them hello, tell them they look good in their Sunday outfit. Then you can go ahead and grab a seat. Amen. 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 Hey, my name's Ed. I'm the lead pastor here at Amplify Church and so glad that you're with us here today. Listen, if this is your very first time at Amplify, we are thrilled that you're with us this morning. We know it's a big deal to come to a new place. And so we just want to make today as easy and as life-giving for you as possible. So we got a team in the foyer. They would love to say hi to you. They can answer any questions you might have, but we'd love for you to stop by and fill out our form that you're new here for the first time. We want to give you a gift just for showing up. Um, I did have someone ask me if, I, if I've been coming, but I've never stopped at the welcome desk, can I come? And yes, the answer is yes. That if you've been coming, if, if this season for you is new to Amplify and you want to stop by, we would love to meet you, uh, and learn about more who you are, how you found us, and really just tell you how honored we are that you're with us here today. So stop by in the foyer. We would love to connect. Uh, we do have our Amplify Church app. If you do not have this, I'm gonna encourage you to download it. If you wanna download it, you can scan the QR code on the back of your chair. You can go ahead and grab it. It is brand new. We just rolled this out this month. And so I wanna encourage you to grab it, log in, create your login and get connected because this is gonna be your personal gateway to all things Amplify. We're super pumped about this here internally and we believe it's gonna be a great thing for the life and health of our church. All of the events I'm talking about right now, you can learn about right on, right, I'm gonna tell you about them, but they're on the app. You can give, you can find a group, you can add a prayer, all of the things. A prayer came in this week and uh, we got a team uh, of people that see these prayers and, and some dedicated people that respond to them. But I saw one come in and I know I, on, there's certain you know, individuals that get to see it. And so I clicked on it on my app because I have access, right? And so I saw the prayer come in and uh, man, I just resonated with the prayer. And so immediately I'm clicking this person's email and I'm responding to them and, and, and saying a prayer right there in that moment for this individual. And so when you pray, you got team of people that wanna rally around you and, and stand with you in whatever you're dealing with. So you got, you got that, uh, your serving requests, groups, I mean, everything, it's all in there. So I can't encourage you enough, make sure you download it. A few things I wanna put on your radar that you're gonna see on the app. We got team night coming up September 24th. If you serve on a team, you wanna be part of a team, this is gonna be for you. It's Tuesday night, come on out. We'd love to have you. September 22nd, is that next week? Next week, y'all, Baptism Sunday, come on. We got a bunch of people signed up already. If you, if you are interested in baptism, we got a meeting right after church in the room off of the foyer. We'd love to, for you to stop by and we can answer questions about baptism. We also have a blessing board serving event coming up. You can learn about how to sign up for that on the app. They are one of our local missions partners. In the foyer after church today, you're gonna see multiple desks. We're gonna have a desk if you need some support with your app. We're gonna be out there. If you have trouble logging in, if you have trouble with giving, all of it, it's gonna be out there. We also have groups that are kicking off. And so we got small group Bible studies that meet throughout the week. We got interest groups, but I'm gonna highlight our Wednesday night Philippian study that's gonna be happening. This is a perfect opportunity. Come on, a uh, perfect opportunity for you to come if you're new to studying the Bible and you just wanna, man, receive more of God's word. It's gonna be on Wednesday nights at seven, starting in, I think, two weeks. And so go on the app and you don't have to register, but you can grab the details on there and just show up. It's gonna be great. So come on Wednesday nights. I'll be doing 
some of the teaching, Pastor Brandon, Pastor Rob, Pastor Leah. It's gonna be a great group throughout the whole journey of Philippians. I also have a, a special thing I'm announcing. And this is specifically for the volunteers of Amplify Church. We got the Ampi Awards coming for the volunteers of Amplify. Hold the date, Friday, October 18th. If you serve in any capacity in any ministry of Amplify Church, this night is for you. Um, if you do not volunteer, what are you doing? That is my question for you, okay? Um, uh, for real, I believe we are all part of making this happen, right? We are all part of creating a place here for people to meet God. So one, if you aren't volunteering, sign up to serve. You can do that right on the app. If you have questions about where you can serve, you can also uh, stop by the welcome desk. But this night, Friday, October 18th, is gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna celebrate all the volunteers of Amplify Church who make church possible. The staff are gonna make fools of ourselves, which is gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, so you wanna make sure you uh, get to see that. And we're gonna have some food and hang out. Um, this is, this is a black tie affair. So uh, <laughs> come dressed up. Pull out those prom dresses, ladies. Uh, grab your best. Um, I mean, you don't have to, but listen. I, I encourage you to. It's gonna be great. We're gonna have a red carpet. It's gonna be tons of fun. Hold the date, Friday, October 18th. All right. I just covered a lot, but it's cool. It's nice. I like when there's stuff happening in your church for us to be a part of, right? Find community, get connected, find ways to be involved. So before we continue with the service, we're gonna have an opportunity to give. I'm gonna read a verse to you. This is Proverbs 18, very simple. It says, a gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. We've been in a series called Easy Money these last few weeks, and week one I talked about how generosity opens doors. I believe that generosity makes a way, and I really believe this to be true. I didn't use this verse a few weeks ago, but I believe it represents a similar thing. I believe there's something unlocked in your life whenever we live a life of generosity. I believe it practically can open doors. I believe practically it can build relationships. I also believe it unlocks something in the kingdom of God. I don't fully understand it. I just know that's what God's word says. And so I wanna fully operate in a, a, a level of generosity while I'm here on this earth. That's how Jesus lived his life, and I wanna make sure my life represents him, that it looks more like Jesus. And so I wanna encourage all of us, step into generosity today. Step into what God has for you, because I believe when we step into levels of generosity, something gets unlocked in our souls, in the kingdom of God, in our communities, in your relationships. And I believe God can do more with our giving together than he can apart. It allows us to make a difference here and around the world. So I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna have an opportunity to give. If you wanna give, we're gonna have some containers down through the aisles. You can also scan the QR code on the back of your seat as well. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for who you are. We thank you that you modeled generosity while you were here on this earth. You didn't live in a way that says, man, what am I letting go of or what am I giving up? You lived your life in a way that said, man, what, what do I have to, to give to the world? What do I have to make a difference in the world? And so Father, would you receive our offering today? Would you bless it? Would you stretch it? Would you multiply it? Would you allow us to make a difference in our city, in our communities and around the world? And Lord, I pray that you'd be faithful, pour your blessing back in the life of every person here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, hey, thanks, band. Appreciate y'all. Hey, while we're giving today, um, can we make some noise and welcome up to the platform our founding pastor, Lee Kreicher. <laughs> you know, uh, I have to tell you, Ben Roethlisberger is the second most represented jersey here today. There's more TJ Watts in the building, more TJ Watts. So um, he's been overtaken, so... There you go. <laughs> I was debating between buying a Russell Wilson jersey for this season or a Justin Fields jersey for this season. And then I remembered last year I bought a Kenny Pickett jersey. <laughs> and so I've decided to stick with something that will be forever relevant, the Big Ben jersey. Go Steelers. Well, in 2003, Linda and I moved from Atlanta, Georgia, to Oakmont, Pennsylvania. And one thing we would do if we were driving across the river, we were driving across the old Holton Bridge. It was built in 1908. And every time I drove across the bridge, I had white knuckles <laughs> gripping onto the steering wheel. 
because, especially if there's a big truck coming the other way. And so um, it felt to me like these were two lanes. They were six feet wide each. And my stress level was so high because I was afraid if I go one way, I'm going to hit oncoming traffic. I go the other way, I'm going to hit the concrete barrier on the side. Why? Because there was no margin for error. Then in October of 2015, the new bridge was opened up. Four lanes, 11 feet wide each. It's a breeze now. There, I have no stress at all. Why? Because there is margin. There's margin. And you know what? God wants you to have margin in your life. Because when your margin goes down, your stress goes up. He wants you to have margin in your relationships. He wants you to have margin in your time. And connected to this series, he definitely wants you to have margin in your finances. Now, some of you know personally from experience what it's like to live without margin in your finances. And you go to bed at night worried about how you're going to make ends meet. You wake up in the morning worried about it. Let me tell you this. It's not God's will for you to live that way. That's not the way he intended for you to live. And that's why he gives some pretty straightforward and clear principles in the scriptures that allow us to live with financial margin and in financial peace. And so I hope this becomes your prayer today with this message. And that's this, Lord, please help me to more effectively apply your timeless principles to my finances. If you're in a place today of financial distress, find, I mean, find a good Christian counselor who can help you through it. A lot of us in the church have been helped by Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University, which you can connect to online. But no matter how you feel about your finances today, pay attention to these principles. And I, I know one person said to me, I don't need principles the God will give me a financial miracle whenever I need it. And you know what? God is a God of miracles. And you can go, I mean, God provided for Elijah during a time of drought. He fed him with ravens. Now, I would have picked a different bird. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, you can't deny it. It was a miracle. God will provide. He's a miracle working God. But do you want to live a life going from one financial crisis to another, to another, to another, and every time saying, give me a miracle, give me a miracle. One financial distress, time of financial distress to another, to another, give me a miracle, give me a miracle. That's not God's plan. That's why he gives us these principles. And the same Holy Spirit who would provide those miracles, and he does. And you may need one today. You can trust him to do so. But that same Holy Spirit will bring to your heart and to your mind, which of these timeless principles can really help to transform your life? And the earlier you get this, the better it is. So let's talk about them. Timeless financial principle number one, wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Let's read that together. Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. You know, one of the greatest gifts you can give to your children is to help them to value a work ethic, the importance of hard work. I mean, work hard is clearly what is coming through on this principle. Now, I know what human nature is. Our human nature is, I'd rather do it a different way. I'd rather go in a different direction. Lord, um, I want to be financially blessed, but without the hard work part. I mean, Lord, help me to win the lottery. Help me to gamble my way to riches. Show me someone I can sue so I can get their money. And in fact, as I think of it, Lord, I know Uncle Charlie has me in his will. Take him to heaven quickly. I know that he'll like it up there. And we have this idea. Now, there's another passage that says, God will bless the work of our hands. But what we want to say is, Lord, you know, I want your blessing. But I really don't want to 
have you bless the work of my hands. I just want you to bless me. But that's kind of going against the principles of God. Now, hard work looks different in different seasons of life. Hard work looks different if you're working inside of the home or outside of the home. If you're a student or if you're getting your paycheck from a full-time job or if you're working as a volunteer. For some of you, you're reaping the benefits of hard work from many, many years ago. And even if you wanted to, you couldn't work as hard as you did decades ago. But no matter what season of your life you're in, no matter what situation you're in, this is a great thing to pray today. Lord, open my eyes to see what hard work looks for me. In my situation, in my season of life, open my eyes to see what hard work looks for me. Do you think God will answer that prayer? I believe he will, because he knows that it is wise to work hard. Principle number two, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Let's read it together. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. The writer of Proverbs makes it clear, people who spend whatever they get are fools. I would put it this way, people who spend whatever they get are not wise. It's not wise. Now, the writer of Proverbs, who likely was Solomon, King Solomon, he would have known the story of Joseph from Genesis. God led Joseph to save, and Joseph obeyed. He didn't just say, well, whatever happens, God will provide at the time. No, God said save. Joseph saved, and he saved an entire nation, an entire region of the world. He saved countless lives. He got reconnected to his family, all because... God led him to save, and he obeyed. He saved. And it was a catalyst for great, great things. It's wise to have a plan to save. And maybe it's for your long-term retirement. Maybe it's a savings account or some other investment vehicle so that you're saving toward a future need. And there is no specific amount specified in the scriptures for how much to save. There's no specific percentage but I think this is a really good prayer to pray this week. Lord, should I be saving more? Lord, should I be saving? Would it be wise for me to save more? Will God answer that prayer? I believe he will. Why? Because he teaches us it is wise to save. Timeless principle number three. The borrower is slave to the lender. Okay, let's read that one together. The borrower is slave to the lender. What, what's this passage saying? Don't go into debt trying to acquire stuff that you want, that you can't afford. Don't do it. It's not saying you shouldn't have a mortgage. It doesn't say you shouldn't take out a small business loan if you need it. But it's saying be cautious because when you try to borrow for things that you can't afford, it doesn't turn out well. It doesn't turn out well. I was listening to a financial expert um, this past week, and he was talking about the fact that credit usage has been down in the last couple of years. It's not because people are not spending as much. It's because so many people have reached their credit limit. And he spoke about one person who said to him, you know what, with inflation... My dollar doesn't go nearly as far as it used to, but I'm not compromising on my standard of living. I don't care if I have to max out my credit cards. Now, that's understandable, but those are not the words of a wise person. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to digress for a moment and, and talk about this idea of empathy. I'm not naturally empathetic over a lot of things. Um, and sometimes I have to work hard at being empathetic. And that includes recently when my good friend Mark Soreo um, lost his dog, Izzy, who, uh, if, there is, if there are dogs in heaven, I believe there are. Izzy is certainly there. Um, but at any rate, I knew he was feeling this deeply. But I never had a dog. Even when I was a little kid, I never had a dog. And I thought, how can I empathize with him? And then I remembered watching this movie called John Wick. 
John Wick, this guy killed his dog. John Wick killed the guy who killed his dog. Then he killed 76 of his friends and associates. And I thought, you know what? If John Wick would kill 77 people over losing his dog, of course Mark is upset over losing his dog. And all of a sudden, this empathy arose within me. And you can confirm with him. I was surprisingly and admirably empathetic. <laughs> well, here's the thing about empathy. I don't have to work up empathy to understand that sometimes it's easy to buy things you can't afford. That was something that I did a fair amount over my life. Um, there was a time when I thought I deserved to have a new car every two years, no matter how high the payments were. And yet, that is, it turned out to be not so good in a lot of situations. I kind of learned it the hard way. And you know what? You can learn from the scriptures about principles, or you can learn them the hard way. The sooner you learn them from the scriptures, the easier your life is going to be. I figured out something. Nothing I went into debt for was worth the stress that I felt with my finances after. So what's that mean? It means it's wise to live contently. It's, contentment is this, having a standard of living you can afford and being okay with that. Because contentment, you're not rich because of the size of your house or the model of your car or what kind of sneakers you wear or what kind of vacations you go on. You're rich because you live a God-honoring life and you're okay with that. You're not comparing yourself with someone else. This is a good prayer to pray this week, a good request of God. Lord, help me to be content. What's that look like? Help me to be content. I think God will answer that prayer because it is wise to live contently and not try to live above your means in a way that really can be destructive. Timeless principle number four. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. One more time, let's read it together. The world of the generous gets larger and larger the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Work hard, save wisely, live contently, give generously. Linda and I met when we were college students at IUP, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and we were endeavoring to serve God in some way. And I remember reading this passage that was written 400 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It was written by a prophet named Malachi. And this is what the passage reads. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This was a clear command and promise to the Israelites. Basically, he was saying, if you have a hundred bushels of wheat from your harvest, bring 10 of them to church, to the temple with you. And I promise the 90 that are left will stretch far beyond what the hundred would have been for you. Now, that's not intuitive, but it was real. It is real. It was a promise that went along with a command. Um, back at that time, as a teenager, I was drawn much more to promises in the scriptures than principles. I just liked the promises. I sure liked this one. I said, you know what? This idea, I, I want the floodgates of heaven opening up, God's blessing pouring out. I really like that idea. And so I decided, I was a guitar teacher at the time while I was a student, and I made $50 a week teaching guitar lessons at Indiana Music House. Um, so I said, you know what? I'll give $5 a week to the church I was going to. I like the church, and this seemed like a, a good idea, especially if the windows of heaven were going to pour out upon me. I do remember thinking, 
nine of the students I teach, which I got $5 each for them, nine of them, I'm, I, I, I'm actually earning the money. I'm teaching one basically just so I can give money to my church. But again, it's worth it if the floodgates of heaven are going to open up. I can go with that. Um, $50 a week is not much money. $45 is even less to live on, which means it helps explain why the, the only, the most expensive date I ever took Linda on before we were married was to the pizza house across from the Oak Grove at IUP. And we bought a small pizza. I had three pieces. She had one. What's beautiful about that is I have never had to wonder if Linda married me for my money. Um, it was clear that she didn't. But at any rate, here's, here's something that happened. We decided to tithe, and including after you're we married. After you're we married, my first full-time job was selling floor covering for Montgomery Wards at the Indiana Mall. I made $300 a week. You may think, well, that wouldn't be much money today. I promise, that wasn't much money then. Um, <laughs> of the $300 a week, we decided to give $30 a week to our church. And, uh, you know, it shouldn't have been. But it was a lot harder to give that 30 than it had been to give five. Because we, it, it seemed like a lot, it, for us, it was a lot of money to give at a time where we really needed every dollar that could come in. But we really found that there was something that we felt was the right thing to do. And we've just followed through with that during our lives. We've always given 10% of our income, um, at least. And whether it was to our local church or to help support the Compassion International kids we sponsored, to help with Christ-centered organizations like Refuge for Women or SEAPC or the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation, we've always given 10%. I remember in 1989 when we were deciding if we could build this building, this room we're sitting in, and this wing of classrooms where we've got 100, 150 kids right now, we gave 20% that year. Why? Because we believed in what was happening. And we just had to sense that thousands of lives could be changed in this place. And they have been. Um, we loved Amplify Church then. We love Amplify Church now. Here, here's some things we do as a result. First, we pray. I hope you do too. If you love this place, this church, this family, pray. You pray for your family, you pray for your needs, you pray for our city, you pray for our nation. Pray for your church and its leaders. Don't underestimate the power of your prayers. Attend. You know, there's something about connecting with the rest of your church family. When you can attend in person, attend in person. When you can't, attend online. But stay connected. Stay connected. That's a part of being a part of a church. This is really important, invite. Do you know the number one reason why people attend Amplify Church? It's not because they drove by and they saw our awesome building. It's not even because they found us online. It's because they accepted the invitation of a trusted friend or family member. Think about the people that you can invite. Think about the people God wants you to invite. It could change their lives. It could change their families forever. Pray, attend, invite, volunteer. The other day, a couple of Sundays ago, I was walking through the kids' wing, and one of the rooms didn't have any kids in it. It wasn't because we couldn't have used it, but we just don't have quite as many volunteers as we need for the rapidly growing children's ministry happening here at the church. I remember when Linda and I were first married, the first thing we did when it related to volunteering was to help with the children's ministry. Why? Because that's where the need was. And I know we impacted lives. And you can too. But of course, the most important reason is because you can come to the AMPI Awards Night if you start to volunteer in one way or another. And it's no surprise, this last piece, to donate. The donate part was important 
because I knew the percentage, whatever percentage of income we were giving, it was going to help the church fulfill its mission, even in far, far away places. You know, we always tried to give generously. In 2006, we were humbled by the generosity of another church member. What we were doing is we, we wanted to build a kids' theater, which is still in use today. And the kids' theater, I had a few people in the church back then. We were very small. The average age of our church was well into our, right around 60. And one person said, why would we build a kids' theater? There are no kids. I said, that's exactly why we would build a kids' theater. Well, we needed $50,000 to build it. We raised as much as we could. It was $10,000. That's how much we raised. And it was like, where's the rest going to come from? And a woman named Eleanor Evans, who were in, was in her mid-80s at the time, she made an appointment, came to see me in the church office, and she said, Pastor Lee, I want to invest in what we're doing here for the next generation. And she handed me a check for $40,000. It was not $40,000 she had. She was not rich as most people count being rich. But there was something in her heart. A few years later, she went to heaven. I think she found out firsthand what Jesus meant when he said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven instead of treasures on earth. But you, you know what I loved? I loved she didn't have to wait till she went to heaven. You should have seen the smile on her face when she saw those kids walking into that kids' theater for the first time and her, gener her generosity to pave the way to make it happen. I turned 70 years old earlier this summer, and that's maybe why I'm a baby, <laughs> thinking about things, questions, things like that. Um, I know what you're thinking. There's no way you're 70. You're so youthful. I, I, I appreciate your thoughts about that. But anyway, Linda and I, um, we're in a better place financially than I ever dreamed we would have been when we first started dating, when we were first married. It's the blessing of God. I thank God for it. I think part of it, though, has been because we've tried to follow these timeless principles. I think part of it is because we've tried to work hard. I think part of it is because we've tried to save wisely. I think part of it is because we've tried to live contently. I think a primary part of it is because we've tried to give generously. Early on, I had heard someone say, save, give 10%, save 10%, and live contently on what's left. It's a pretty good equation. But whatever equation you choose to live by, here's something I encourage you to do this week. Determine the percentage of your income that you are giving. That is your current level of generosity. Then prayerfully decide if it is the right percentage. And worship team, you can head on out. I'm going to read that again. Determine the percentage of your income that you are giving. That's your current level of generosity. Then prayerfully decide if it is the right percentage. You know, a few weeks ago, Pastor Ed talked about the very first time he stood right here and gave a message in this sanctuary. And I was a senior pastor at the time, so I had him review his message with me before he spoke it to be able to give him feedback. And he told me he had a humorous illustration about when he was a teenager, he and some of his buddies scammed a local McDonald's and got some food for free. To his surprise, I said, the only way you're allowed to use that illustration is if you go to the McDonald's you scammed, which he did, and try to make restitution. Well. I didn't even remember that I told him to do that, to be honest. But I can tell you why I told him to do it. Because it was more important, there was something more important than him to develop his speaking skills. It was to develop Christ-like character. To, and you know what? I thank God he's developed his speaking skills pretty well. 
And I thank God that he's developed Christ-like character in a great and amazing way. At least from what I understand, he now pays for his food every time he goes to McDonald's. Thank you, Jesus! What's that have to do with generosity? Well, our generosity is a reflection of our Christ-like character. If we're a follower of Jesus, we want to become more and more like him. Which means you forgive people even when you don't feel like it. Even when you're feeling bitter towards them because of what they did to you or a loved one. You still forgive them anyway because you want to be like Jesus. It means you're kind to people. In person or online. Even when you feel like being critical and harsh and cynical. You're kind. And if you want to be like Jesus, you become more and more generous. That's just a part of what it is. We grow in generosity. The Apostle Paul wrote, be careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. It's wise. It's wise to work hard, to save wisely. It's wise to live contently. And it's wise to give generously. I would just encourage you this week, there is financial margin in God's plan for your life. There is financial peace as God's will for your life. But make this your prayer, your overall prayer this week. Lord, please help me to more effectively apply your timeless principles to my finances. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're a miracle working God and you do miracles in our life when we're at our lowest points, including financially. And Lord, we thank you that in addition to the miracles you do, that you give us principles so that we can be at peace. Lord, give us your wisdom. Lord, I pray that the same Holy Spirit who does miracles in our midst would speak to each and every one of our hearts this week about what you would have us to know and to do according to your timeless principles. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you love us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, can we thank Pastor Lee for the word? Um, hey, my life was transformed attending this church under his uh, teaching and leadership and so grateful for him and Linda and everything that they've uh, poured into this house. And uh, for people like them, for people like Eleanor, um, this place exists to continue reaching you, your friends, your family, and the next generation. And we're gonna keep doing that uh, until Jesus comes back, amen. Hey, let's stand to our feet. We're gonna get ready to sing, um, but before we do, we're gonna, we'll respond in worship. But before we do, I wanna give people an opportunity to respond to the message of Jesus. And it's so interesting because Lee uh, is talking about what him and Linda have prayerfully decided to give. And there's context within the Old Testament of God's word talking about this, this principle of 10%, but it was, it was within the Old Testament law. And the Old Testament laws had 613 laws that you had to follow in order to be in right standing with God. And part of it included what you gave to the church. It was 10%. And all of these laws, really, you, you had to follow. And there were even more laws that said, when you don't follow these ones, here's what you do in order to regain right standing with God. And I, before, I was talking about the high priest making a sacrifice on behalf of us. That was part of the rules that someone had to go and make a sacrifice on behalf of you whenever you didn't follow the rules so that you and God could be cool, so that God wouldn't be mad at you. When Jesus came, God's word says he fulfilled the law. He didn't come to abolish it, he came to fulfill it. He was a once and for all sacrifice and he fulfilled the law. And so now we're no under the power of the law. We no longer have to follow the 613 laws in order to be in right standing with God. If I'm gonna be generous, it's not because God is forcing me to, it's gonna be because I'm responding to how good he is. Also, if you're gonna be in right standing with God, it's not gonna be because you earn it. And it's not gonna be because you follow all the rules and you do all the things right. 
And still today, people want to establish their relationship with God based on rules. That God will be okay with me if I come to church. That God won't be mad at me if I give. That God won't be mad at me if I didn't swear this week, right? And we come up with our own rules in our head to determine if God is okay with me or not. But here's the only thing you need to know. It's this promise. That God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. Generosity is part of who he is. It's part of his DNA. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This is it. This is it. It's no longer follow all the rules. It's do I trust in Jesus? Do I trust in Jesus? And when you do, when you give your life over to him, man, his, his righteousness covers you. We talked about that earlier. And when God looks at you, he no longer sees you for all the ways we mess up because we mess up a lot. And he no longer casts stones for all the ways we don't follow the rules because, man, we, we couldn't follow the rules even if we tried. But Jesus is so good. He is so good that he came and died for us anyways, for all of our failures, for all of our mistakes. And so right now, I wanna give an opportunity to respond to this promise, respond to the goodness of God. And if there's someone here in, in this room today that needs to respond to who he is, this is your moment. I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. And this is just so you know, yes, today, I'm making a decision to put my trust in Jesus today. And it's not necessarily for anybody else to see, but it's also a public declaration that, yeah, this moment's for me. I've been trying to do my own way. I've been trying to follow the rules. I've been trying to base my relationship based on the rules. But today it's about something else. Today it's about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about me earning it. It's about him. And so I lay my life down for him. I lay down my will for his. I lay down my direction for yours, God. If that's you and you need to put your trust in Jesus today, come on, one, two, three. Right now is the decision, the time to make that decision. Anybody wanna make that decision today? This is your moment. Don't let it pass. Come on. Hey, we're gonna respond to this opportunity. Last week, I saw one hand and there were three, which is amazing. And we celebrate that as a team every Monday. So I don't see a hand right now, but we always pray, believing that someone's gonna respond, responding to the message of Jesus. And for every single one of us, one of Lee's principles was invite. Who can you invite? Because someone needs to hear the message of God's goodness. Someone that you know right now is living their entire life of faith based on their own rules that they've made up in their head. And how can they come to know the message of Jesus? So let's respond to this message. Say, dear Jesus, today I put my trust in you. Today I lay down my old ways and I follow your ways. I admit you are king, you are God, you're my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate today are the goodness of God, his promises over our life. We don't have to earn it. We got Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, if you did make that decision today and I just didn't see your hand, we got a team in the foyer. We would love to connect with you. You can also tell us on the app, hey, I accepted Jesus today and we'll follow up with you. We want to stand with you in this journey, so make sure you let us know. Hey, we're going to respond in worship. We got about 10 minutes left. We're going to respond in worship, so don't miss this moment. Lean into what God wants to do. I believe God's presence fills the room when we lift up praise. So let's lean into what he wants to do. Come on, let's sing. Another step, Lord, would you carry me? When I've lost my fight, will you be my strength? Will you set me a table in the presence of my enemy? Oh, and I shall not want, I shall not want. And all my soul's got a shepherd in the valley And I shall not want I shall not want I shall not want Well, cause my cup's running over, running over And I shall not want And 
And I will lift my eyes to where my health comes from. Oh, and I won't be afraid of the shadow, cause I'll Shepherd. Sing, I shall not want, no, I shall not, no, because my cup's running. Praise. 
We're gonna go out praising with one more song. Come on, can we put our hands up like that? For something, something I knew was there but couldn't see. Now I remember the moment when the one I was searching for found me. Oh, I can't make sense of it. No getting over it. How would you love change everything? Oh, cause I know you now. But I need your love, I need your love I don't want anything else But I need your love, I need your love Oh, say na 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 God, I need you like water Back here next Sunday.